Okay, so we are on Lamed Aleph Amad Bey, that is 31b. Yeah, 31b. And we now get to the Gemara's commentary in the Mishnah, um, which is two comments, really. The first one's uh, more brief, and the second comment extends basically to the end of the chapter. And that's the whole chapter, six. And then we get to chapter seven, God willing, sometime middle of next week. So the Mishnah stated that we are required to have two witnesses to inform us that this woman was secluded with the man about which she was born, the paramour. She, we, must, we must have two witnesses to that event. But even one witness telling us that they actually were intimate behind closed doors is enough to call off the site the law and to cause grounds for divorce without ketubah. But we still have to have two witnesses to the event of their seclusion. How did we come to that conclusion? So explain the, explain the Mishnah. The verse with respect to the law of the Sota says, describing the scenario, he's jealous, he warns her, she secludes herself. And then it goes on to say, in the manner in which the verse says that we don't know what happened behind closed doors is by saying, the aid Ainba, there is no witness in the singular telling us what happened behind closed doors. It, meaning to say that even if we had one witness, it would be enough to substantiate what happened behind closed doors, thus calling off the site the law. So that tells us that in the event of their intimacy, even one witness is enough. As for the fact that you need to have two witnesses for the moment of seclusion, right? In a case where we don't know what happened behind closed doors, we know that you have to have two witnesses derived from the word davar, which means matter, which is what's used to describe grounds for divorce, where it says the husband found a matter of indiscretion. He found a matter of indiscretion in her behavior, and that's why he's divorcing. That word matter is also employed by the verse when it describes the necessity to have two witnesses. In accord with the testimony of two witnesses, do we establish a matter? So this word matter, a matter, an item, davar in Hebrew, is used to describe an event that two witnesses are required to describe. And likewise, the verse described uses the word matter to describe that which the husband found in his wife, the indiscretion he finds in his wife, making a grounds for divorce, which therefore tells us that in order for a husband to have grounds for divorce, there must be a matter established by two witnesses, considering that the verse says elsewhere that a matter is established by two witnesses. And thus, if we only have one witness at the event of their intimacy, that's enough. So where do I have my two witnesses? At the moment of their seclusion making it grounds for divorce. This was the Mishnah's logic. The Gemara is now going to challenge that logic a little bit, considering that the verses required, have to, we have other verses that indicate other things. So that's what we're going to be looking at right now. But was that clear? What if he has two brothers and they're the witnesses? Uh, invalid. They, yeah, right. they have to be kosher witnesses, which means uh, no they relation. Have they have to be people of good repute, mm -hmm. not people who have uh, questionable uh, moral standards, all, all kinds of requirements for witnesses. Because right away with family, it's, it's not balanced. Yeah, no, no, but by, by law, uh, family cannot okay. uh, bear testimony, not for the positive nor the negative. Actually, Rambam writes that the fact that we don't allow family to be witnesses not because they're biased, because even if they are testifying against their own family, we also reject it. It's just family is out, finished. The two witnesses can't be related to each other, nor can the witnesses be related to either of the parties involved in the testimony. Nor can they have any benefit. If the witnesses even have a far-fetched benefit from their testimony, they're also out, right? Conflict of interest. Okay. So now let's look at the Gemara's comment. Hi, Tamil Leimar. This derivation that you in the Mishnah cited, where it states, Kimotza ba'ervas davar, 
the verse reads, that grounds for divorce is when he finds within his wife a matter of indiscretion. And you therefore derive from that word matter that it must have two witnesses because the Torah uses the word matter to describe that which is established by two witnesses. Seemingly, we have a different way of coming to this conclusion. Because Talmud Leimar, elsewhere the Gemara tells us that we derive from the word ba, which means like this. Ba means in it. This is a reference to the verse, which describes the law of the Saita and describes that we don't know what happened behind closed doors. Where there it says, the aid ain ba. There is no witness to it. There is no witness to their intimacy. Right? And because it says witness in the singular, we derived, the verse says, we don't know what happened behind closed doors. The verse says, there is no witness in it. But if there is a witness, even one, it would be enough to invalidate the site of law. But we derive elsewhere from the word in it to say, only in it is there this leniency of allowing one witness. In other cases, you have to have the full two. So that's, that verse is enough to tell us that anything other than their intimacy behind closed doors requires the witnesses, including their, their seclusion. So I don't need to rely on the fact that the verse says he found a matter, and the verse says elsewhere that a matter is by two witnesses. By the very fact that the verse says that only in it, only in their intimacy do I allow for the leniency of one witness, that alone is enough to tell me that anything else requires two. Clear? So let's see the Gemara's language. Talmud Leimar, we already derived elsewhere from the verse which says ba in it. Ba in it, in the case of knowing their intimacy, is there the leniency to allow for one, one witness? But not at the moment of their warning, which requires two witnesses. This is a discussion whether or not they require two witnesses. I give the email to, rem to remind me of that discussion that we had earlier in the Gemara, but for the, for the purposes of the discussion here, I'm leaving that out because the Gemara doesn't get into it. And ba v'loi in it, in the event of their intimacy, do we have the leniency that one witness is enough? But not for the not for the event of their seclusion. The event of their seclusion needs two witnesses. Me and this is where we derive that law. <coughs> so why then does the Mishnah say that? How do I know I need to have two witnesses for the event of the seclusion? Because the verse says you must find a matter of indiscretion. And a matter is a description used to define two witnesses to define elsewhere in the verse. You don't need to go through that whole, that whole uh, mental arithmetic. Right there in the verse where it says, in it, one witness works. In it, in the moment of their intimacy. But anything else requires two, <laughs> as is the universal law. And therefore, the event of the seclusion would require two. But yet the Mishnah still says that we require the verse which says a matter. So we have to therefore blend these two teachings. These two derivations must be blended because we have a Mishnahic source that uses both of them. One here, our Mishnah uses this word, a matter, to tell us that the matter must have two witnesses as for the verse elsewhere. And we have a Mishnah elsewhere which says, from the fact that the verse says, ba in it, means only in it do you have one witness, but not anything else. So we have to somehow merge these two derivations, giving us a more holistic picture of how we come to this conclusion. So let's see. It says the Gemara Hachanami Kamar. What we mean is that this too is part of the derivation, meaning both of them. How is that? So let's take one at a time. Talmud Leimar, the verse came and taught us, Ba, in it. In it, in the event of their intimacy, we give you the leniency to allow for one witness to tell us that they were intimate and thus calling off the site. And therefore, ba in it, do you, can you rely on one witness? The loy but not for the, not for the warning. The warning requires two. And ba in it, do you allow for one witness? The loy but not in the moment of the seclusion. The seclusion requires two witnesses. Okay, that's clear. But the tumma ba alma the loy What about witnesses that come and tell us? that she was unfaithful, but there was no warning and no seclusion. What then? The verse which tells us that the moment of their intimacy can be reported to us even by one witness, that's described in the context of the site of law, in which there was already a warning and there's witnesses to seclusion. What about when we find that she was intimate, 
but not with any warning or seclusion. No, no context. One person arrives and says, I saw Mrs. So-and-so cheat with so-and-so. Is that enough grounds for divorce? Is that enough grounds to say she may not be with her husband anymore? I might conclude because by the Sarta law, the Torah says that the intimacy is allowed to be reported by one witness. Maybe that's universal. That no matter what, infidelity can be reported by one witness. If he actually saw the intimacy, maybe that's what I would conclude. That's what the Gemara says. The so Tumba Balma, sorry? That can only happen if you're in the fields or or whatever, yeah, sorry, they were out in the field. Exactly, exactly. So the Tumba Balma, ordinary infidelity, the Loikin, without any warning, without any seclusion. So the only witnesses, the only report on the event is the actual intimacy itself. And the Loi Muhammad Ain Echad, should I conclude that I don't believe a single witness? Minolam, how would I know that? Seemingly, with regard to the law of the Saita, the Torah gives us a leniency and says the event of intimacy is allowed to be reported by one witness. So perhaps I would make that a universal rule, even without warning. Whenever a person arrives and says, I saw so-and-so be unfaithful, we accept the witness. Therefore, says our Mishnah, no, 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 no. The verse says a matter. Nemar Kandavar, it says with respect to finding grounds for divorce. It says that he found a matter of indiscretion. The Nemar Lahalon, and it says elsewhere, with respect to the law of witness, that the two witnesses are required to establish davar a matter, just like there, with respect to the matter of testimony. The verse says explicitly, it must be two witnesses. Afkan, so to here, with respect to the matter that's ground for divorce, the must have two witnesses. In other words, what the Gemara is telling us is like this. In order for there to be grounds for divorce based on infidelity, right? based on infidelity, there must be two witnesses to some event. So if the only event here is her infidelity, then that becomes regular testimony, and the verse says matter, and matter must have two witnesses. And that's what the Mishnah meant. Yet, in the case of the Saita, because you already have two witnesses to the seclusion, and you already have established witness to the event of warning, so you already have so much context to believe that there's an infidelity, the story has legs. Then the Torah gives dispensation that the moment of intimacy is enough to have one witness, but only if it has two witnesses to the seclusion and witnesses to the warning. So you already have smoke. So one witness to the fire is enough. But ordinarily, if there is no warning and there is no uh, seclusion, it's just one guy arrives and says, I saw her being unfaithful. We're not going to take that witness. Because there, the Torah says, Dovar, you have to establish the matter. And the matter is only established with two witnesses, as described in the verse elsewhere. Is that clear? So now we have a meshing of the two, of the two derivations. The derivation which says that the moment of intimacy, we have a leniency that one witness is enough. That derivation, ba which says in it, you can rely on one witness in the case of intimacy, but not in the case of, of seclusion. That derivation is limited to the law of Saita when you actually have two witnesses for seclusion. But the derivation of our Mishnah, which says that the matter must have two witnesses, that is ordinarily when there is no warning and there is no seclusion. It's just the event of intimacy itself. Then, Dovar, it's a matter that must have two witnesses. And this is how the Gemara blends the two Derivations. Okay. Clear? Yeah. Scott, you with me? Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Now let's go to the next comment in the Gemara. We'll begin it because it's a long comment. This comment, as I mentioned, runs to the end of the chapter, but we'll begin the process and we'll continue on Monday. Okay, so the Mishnah further stated the, the rule in the Mishnah was like this. We have one witness that's allowed to tell us that they were intimate after the two witnesses seclusion and so on. If one witness comes and says, I saw they were intimate, the the law is called off, divorce, no kisubba. Okay. Then we learned that if you have another witness to cancel the first witness, then the the law is back on because the two witnesses cancel each other out and you're left with 
square one, which is the two witnesses who told us that they were secluded. So the site of law continues. That's what the Gemara, that's what the Mishnah said. So the Gemara is not gonna break it down because the way the Mishnah Mishnah said it is by repeating a number of different cases. So we'll go through them quickly. First, the Mishnah said, one witness tes- testifies that she was intimate. Another witness comes and denies that testimony. So it's one against one, right? One guy says, I saw Tuesday, three o'clock, they were intimate. And the other guy comes along and says, what are you talking about? Tuesday, two, three o'clock, I was there with you. We didn't see anything. So they cancel each other out. So Haisa Shaisa, she would drink this out of the water because it keeps on going. Likewise, uh, one woman says she was, a woman test witness says she was intimate versus a woman saying she wasn't intimate. Sight the law continues. Cancel each other out. One witness comes and says she is, she was intimate. And two witnesses come and say she wasn't. And of course, the two override the one, and the start the law continues. Now, if in the reverse, two witnesses come and say she was intimate. One says she wasn't. The two override the one. The start the law is called off because two witnesses are saying she's intimate. These are the cases in the Mishnah, right? So. Well, we have, there's a few different principles that we have here that's being established. The, the main principle that's being established here is that one witness and one witness are equal to each other. That's what we're being established here. That's the main principle we're trying to establish. And therefore they cancel each other out. And thus, um, and thus so the law continues. The Gemara is going to lead us down a track. Sorry? How could it continue? Because we don't know what happened behind closed doors anymore. One guy says they were intimate at this time. The other guy says not true. I was with you. So That's right. It doesn't mean that they were never intimate. It could be they were intimate some other time when they weren't there. So the site of the law continues because we have no testimony as to what happened behind closed doors. Because the one guy who came and said that they were intimate has been canceled out by the other guy. So we're back to square one, in which we don't know what happened behind closed doors. But we do have two witnesses to their seclusion already. Right? So... The site of law therefore continues. One is lying. That's right. So we cancel them out, okay. leaving us not knowing what, what behind, happened behind closed doors. So we're back to square one. Allowing the site of law to continue. Okay. So but, but the Mishnah Gemara is going to lead us down a track to the, to the following question. This is the main question the Gemara wants to get to. It's going to go through a little exercise to get to that question, but this is the main question it wants to get to as Rashi explains for us, which is like this. If Toyota says that a single witness is believed for X event, then we treat that single witness as if he was two. In other words, like this, it's not as if, there's two ways to think about the dispensation, the the leniency to allow the one witness to tell us that they were intimate. One is to say, we're lowering the bar of testimony here. We're lowering it to one. And if we're lowering it to one, then one witness, another witness, they're equal. But the Gemara is telling us it's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is that in this circumstance, we're taking one witness and we're elevating to the status of two. As opposed to saying that we're lowering the standard here, allowing for one witness, what we're really doing is we're saying, you one witness, you become like two. Now, if that's the case, then what happens? One guy comes and says, I saw them be intimate. That testimony is as valid as two witnesses. Because he saw the whole thing. Because he saw the whole thing. And Toyota tells us that in this circumstance, we believe one guy. Peeping Tom. Turn, we, we, so we turn that one guy into as valuable as if two witnesses were here. Right? Now, when another guy comes and denies what he's saying, it's like as if one against two. Because we don't have any verse giving us dispensation to say we believe one witness to undo a testimony. We don't have that. But the Torah did say that a single witness telling us of their intimacy is treated as if it's a complete full testimony of two. So how can one and one cancel each other? The one guy who comes and says they were intimate should be counted as two. And then the single guy who comes and says, I saw no, is only one. It's one against two. Even though in fact, it's only one against one. But by law, it's one against two. This is the, this is the Gemara's going to lead us down a logic to get to this question. Following? Yeah. My, I have a question though. Yeah. This week's Parsha talks about all the... 
the transgressions in with intimacy yeah the, the, the forbidden relations the forbidden relations and this falls into punishable by death yeah so if the soita law is called off yeah and she forfeits her ketubah for yeah. divorce yeah is she still punishable by death by the court we can't because you don't know what happened i mean god can do whatever he likes but in terms of the court the court doesn't know if they, she was actually unfaithful Right? The whole point of the Saita law is because of this. Right. So really, we're part of, the Saita law because there's a witness saying that she was intimate. intimate. Okay, so the witness is not enough to make her li liable for punishment by, by death. It's not enough. But by canceling the Saita law proceeding, yeah. that's, sa that's saving her life. Because if she would go through the Saita proceeding, she would drink and she would, yeah, I, I, suppose I, I suppose that's true, yeah. So then I don't understand how. We're always looking to save people's lives, even sinners, not looking to kill them. The court is responsible. I didn't write the Torah. I know, the Torah, and the Torah, so I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the Torah says, I'm telling you, the Torah says to find reasons to make the sinner live. There's all kinds of laws built into the Torah to make it extremely difficult for our capital punishment to ever be implemented. The Gemara says that if a court kills a person, more than once every seven years. It's a cruel court. Seven years. How often, how, how many, how often is there a death penalty in Texas? So, like every nine oh, minutes. Yeah, every, so what? Every seven minutes. Every nine, seven minutes yeah, someone else put a death? Yeah. In Torah law, it's once every seven years. Anything more than that would be considered an evil court. The Gemara's other versions which says it's once every 18 years. Right? We're, we're actually required by law to find reasons not to kill them. Our pay, not to kill our, our suspect. So if the Saita law is going to save her life, good, let it save her life. We're not looking to kill sinners. It also no. says that if somebody desecrates the Shabbos, he's, he's yeah. liable for stoning. Yes, I, I once heard an explanation here, and I think it's very, very right, which is, it, it's funny. On the one hand, Turner has all these rules about killing people, capital punishment for all kinds of punishments, and yet we never do it, so what's the point? So I, I heard someone say this, and I think it's right. On the one hand, Turner wants to know, wants you to know how bad that sin is. You know how bad Shabbos is? It, co it should cost you your life. In reality, we don't want, we don't want anybody dying. So we're going to make it very difficult for someone to ever die because you violated Shabbos. But you should know that's how bad Shabbos is. So Torah wants to do two things at once. It wants to tell you that act is so horrible that by Torah law, you should really die for that. But in reality, we don't want people dying. So we're going to figure out a way to make sure no one dies. Fine. But you should know how bad it is. That's kind of a way to understand the tired of thinking. Stoning is a real cruel way. Uh, all of it is. Actually, the, 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 it's funny, right? We're, we're in this week's parasha, where the mitzvah of a to love your fellow Jew as yourself, right? Love, that's in this week's parasha. It's in Kedoshim, right? Yeah? yeah. So uh, the Gemara in Sanhedrin tells us that because because you have to love your fellow as yourself, therefore, if you're going to be doing capital punishment, you have to make sure it's done in the most dignified and painless way because love your fellow as yourself. And if you were put to death, would you not want to pain, painless? Good, so make sure it's painless for him too. So the Gemara goes through the whole exercise to make sure that we're satisfying Torah law of stoning or strangulation and whatnot. And it goes through all kinds of scenarios to make sure that it's done in such a way that it doesn't hurt the person. He dies on impact or so on, whatever. If, for example, death by burning is not uh, ote de fe where they have a fire. It's lead go hot lead going into the person's mouth, so he dies instantaneously by, hot, by burning the insides. Anyway, all kinds of things like that. All to say that it's not as if it should not be understood as, as like, oh, this guy's condemned to death. Boom, we hate him. Drop him, let him suffer and die. It's not like that at all. It's you should. The, the, the poor guy is a sin. What are we going to do? We'll try our best to make sure he doesn't live, make sure he doesn't die, make sure he lives. And if he has to, or try the way to make sure it's as least, as least embarrassing, as most dignified, and as least painful. But also, do we not do these uh, these uh, these acts of capital punishment because we don't have the the temple anymore? Nowadays, we don't do it because we don't have a Sanhedrin. We don't have a lot of a lot of reasons why we don't do it nowadays. Right. So it falls. I'm saying in theory, it falls into the same categories. We don't we don't do the sacrifices because we don't. Have yeah, but I'm saying even in temple times, they wouldn't be doing it willy nilly. Even in temple times, they weren't but, doing it to every guy who came. But they were still doing it. 
very, very rarely, extremely rarely. Right. Extremely. Today, we don't do it at all. Right. Like, it's not as if like every guy who was violating Shabbos was rounded up and killed. Right. It's not exactly. what was going down in Temple Times at all. But once Actually, years, sorry? It's like once in seven years. Uh, that, that, that would be considered too often, the Gemara says. That's cruel. It's too often. Once every seven years. It would be too often. That's what the Gemara says. Sorry? Yeah. In fact, it was more common that they did not rely on these laws for capital punishment. Because the law is that if the court sees that there's behaviors that are becoming too rampant, murder is rampant, so you've got to put a stop to it. So they'll select a few murderers and implement capital punishment to send a message to everybody else, even though those people did not satisfy the full laws of ordinary capital punishment. So it was more common that capital punishment was done by the court as per the need of what's going on in the community, rather than following through step by step and killing the guy because of the law of capital punishment. Understand? It was more common because the, the court sat down and said, okay, we have to put an end to the murder that's going on here. We gotta lower the murder rate. Okay, so we know this guy's a murderer. We know he's a serial killer. Okay, he doesn't satisfy the law because of a thousand different technicalities. If we were gonna do the regular law, he would get out, but we're gonna kill him because we wanna set an example for everybody to know that. So that was more often the manner in which capital punishment was implemented than say, someone going through step-by-step step of all the technical laws of the capital punishment. Anyway, okay, so on Monday, we're gonna go through this exercise in the Gemara, where the Gemara is gonna to come to this concluding question, which is, if one witness is believed, for the moment of intimacy, that means Torah treats that single witness as if he was two witnesses. And therefore, another guy comes and denies the original witness, it's like one against two. So why did the Mishnah say that they cancel each other out? Seemingly, they should not cancel each other out. Seemingly, the single testimony of the person who says they were intimate is a much greater standing than the single guy who comes and says, no, they were not intimate. Because the guy who comes and says they were intimate was given special status by Torah as a believable character. And thus should be treated like two with greater value than the guy who comes and denies it. So why do they cancel each other out? This is the, the Gemara is going to go through a couple of lines of exercise to get to this concluding main point of a question. A wonderful day and a good Nev Shabbos. Sorry, you ever see a stoning? Have I ever seen a stoning? So stoning by Jewish law, it's not like the movies where they tie a guy to a post and throw stones at him. They, they, by Torah law, what they do is they, there's, a, no, there's a, there's a, they bury him and throw, and throw rocks in his head. Not in Torah law. Not in Torah law. That would be way too painful in Torah law. In Torah law, there's a cliff. And at the bottom of the cliff, there's a, there's a sharp rock designed for him to be pushed off and die on impact. And if he didn't die on impact, then they would, Put, throw stones at him and they have stones prepared that were big enough to, for two people to carry and that way if we land the person who would die instantaneously so kind of the same as what we would do with the with the, uh, with the goat yeah but with, with the goat we weren't so uh, careful to make sure it dies on impact but yeah similar kind of thing something similar to yeah. the uh, that's yeah. what I'm I thought that the goat was sent into the desert taken to a desert or a cliff in the desert okay so a giant but it could just be in the desert uh, but at a cliff in the desert. Oh, if you ever, you ever been to if you ever been to Israel, the deserts, there's some beautiful canyons and very cool. I don't know if you've ever gone hiking in the desert in Israel. I went through the Sinai. Awesome. There's beautiful cliffs. Yeah, huge. So, so maybe some of those. I don't know. One of those. They would have. They would have gone there. I don't know. That'd be very far though. It'd be a long walk from Jerusalem to there, on Yom Kippur. Maybe they'd find something closer. I don't know. Because there are other hills in Judea also. The Judean hills are much closer to Jerusalem. I don't know how many cliffs there are there, but there's the Judean hills. Maybe they can find a cliff like there. The stoning I saw was from Iran. Sorry? The stoning I saw was from Right, so in that, in that culture, they're looking to torture the guy who's, who's put to death. Torture. Right, but in Torah law, we're looking to avoid all that. It's not, it's, it's the reverse. Anyway, okay. Have a good day and a good day, Shabbos.